Hi. So, last time what we did was talk about uh, putting in more capital into the production function in order to produce more. And if it was that easy, then the question is, well, why didn't we do that all the time? So, today we're going to talk about the Malthus model. And Thomas Malthus was an economist in the early part of the 19th century, and he basically said, you know what? Whenever we produce more, we just get more people. And so what we've been calling GDP per capita just stays the same. It was very sort of pessimistic view of growth. And while it turned out to be wrong over the next 200 years, it had been correct for the last 2,000 years at least. So let's walk through that model and try to understand why that might be. So recall from the chapter uh, that we can have this production function here where we have the total number of output on the vertical axis and the number of farmers here on the horizontal axis. And you can see that each additional farmer, while increasing total output, adds less and less. And so we can see the average productivity, which is the slope of this line from the origin to point A, uh, is decreasing when we move from A to B. Basically, the slope is getting flatter and flatter uh, as we add more and more farmers. And so Malthus said, you know, as we add more and more farmers, we just produce less and less, and uh, growth is not possible. But another thing he said was that even when we get better at producing, all we do is just add more people in the long run, and again, growth per person is not possible. So let's walk through that model uh, a little bit. So here we can see the production function, right? And if we produce at point A with 800 farmers, we're able to produce 500 kilograms of grain, for example. At point B, when we double those number of farmers from 800 to 1600, we don't double the amount of grain, right? We go from 500 to 720-ish. So in that case, that those second 800 farmers are not adding as much as the first 800. In fact, we can see that the average product of labor goes from 625 to 458. And the marginal product, of course, is falling even faster. And we can measure that just by the slope of the line that connects the origin to each point. So Malthus's model here, I'm going to put myself in the middle here. Malthus's model said, all right, let's think about what happens when we get a good harvest, right? Remember that in, in Malthus's time, output basically meant how much food we could produce. So if we get a good harvest, farmers' incomes rise. That means that they can feed more people. Um, it could be that people live longer. It could be that childhood mortality falls. Uh, it could be uh, whatever the reason is, population goes up. As population rises, we have less land per farmer, or we try to farm land that's not as productive as our regular land. That means that average output per farmer falls. We're going from point A in the previous slide to point B. That means that farmers' incomes fall, because the average product has fallen, and we get back to subsistence. Right? We know if we fall below subsistence levels, then people don't have enough to eat, and so they die. But if we're at that subsistence level, then the population stays the same. In this case, the population is constant back at that initial level, right? So people, we'd, population would go up, we wouldn't have enough food, population would go back down. What if we get an actual improvement in technology? Now, this was happening all the time. It doesn't happen as fast as it has in the last 200 years, but it did happen, right? We uh, increased the uh, ability to use steel, to use iron, things like that. Um, and so when we get an improvement in technology, our production function increases, right? So farmers' incomes rise, population rises, we have less land per farmer. Again, average output per farmer falls, but now we're on that higher production function, and so we can maintain a higher population rate. And so in this case, population goes up, but income per person stays the same. And that's where we're in that Malthusian trap. So the model predicts that we get this sort of self-correcting uh, model of uh, output. We can never grow wages faster uh, than subsistence level, right? And so we're stuck. 
So we can look at this uh, in terms of real wages. We have a lot of good evidence for real wages in Britain going back to the 13th century. And so if we look at that here, we can start at 1280. You can see the population was almost 5 million. And wages were about 60% of what they were in 1860. Okay, so they were lower than they were in 1860, but not by uh, a whole lot. And then as population went up, wages went down a little bit. And then what happened uh, was the Black Death, right? So the bubonic plague came to Europe and killed a whole lot of people. And so population went down, went down, went down. And as population went down, that meant that farmers were more valuable, right? Because the land stayed the same, the capital stayed the same. And so wages started going up and they peaked in the 1490s, right? Now, this is interesting because the wages in the 1490s were almost as high as they were in 1860, right? Almost... 400 years later, 370 years later. But then as income went up, population started to grow. As population started to grow, wages went back down, right? And so by the 1580s, down here, we're only at 70% of wages from the 1860s and population is going back up. 1590s and then 1600, we're basically back where we were in the middle of the 14th century. So the Malthusian trap seems like it was a, a really accurate picture of what was going on in Britain uh, between the 13th and even the 17th centuries. So here we can see the wages um, for the Black Death, and they show that wages don't just go up automatically, right? It's important to think that, uh, to realize that politics plays uh, a big role here. So when the Black Death started in 1347, Wages were actually, you know, fell initially, but then we got some political action. Laborers started to organize, and wages started to go up. We had the Peasants' Revolt in 1381, and wages stayed pretty high until the beginning of the 16th century when they started to fall back down. And we know that one of the reasons that that happened was that population had started to grow again. And as we see, wages only sort of grew very slowly, if at all, with some peaks and valleys uh, until 1800. And we'll see that, you know, wages in Britain didn't really start to go up until the mid-19th century, despite the fact that we really start to see growth in GDP per capita in the middle of the 17th century. So if we think about the Malthusian trap sort of before the Industrial Revolution, uh, here's what was going on in Britain, right? We had the Black Death, wiped out a third of the population, and that increases the bargaining power of workers, right? Bargaining power is going to be a big story that we're going to come back to in Chapter 6. As the bargaining power goes up, those wages start to go up, right? So now there's more land for farmers, and for laborers, they have more power, right? Because you need workers to work the land. Well, if you want me to work your land, you're going to have to pay me. And as those wages rise... People have more food, population goes up, we get population moving back to where it was before the Black Death. That means there's less land per farmer, that means the bargaining power of workers falls, and we end up basically back where we started. Right? And so from a Malthusian point of view, this wasn't surprising. Uh, this is what had been going on all the time. We basically produce enough food to keep people alive, and that's it. And so it's a... Uh, maybe a lesson in terms of predicting the future, that it's really hard because Malthus was right looking back in history, but he was very wrong uh, looking forward. And so that's what we're, the story that we're interested in, right, is why was he wrong in the picture going forward? Well, we can see that the escape sort of started to happen around 1800. Wages started to go up, right? In 1830, they were still no higher than they had been in the 1480s, but they were on an upward trajectory. And then by the 1860s, they had really started to take off. And that's the story that we're interested in, right? That's the beginning of the hockey stick for wages, even though the hockey stick for production, you could argue, started around 1650. So how do we escape the Malthusian trap? Well, again... Part of it is production technology. Part of it is uh, political rights. And so we have the steam engine in the 18th century. We have the spinning jenny in the 18th century. That makes 
the possibility of each worker being much more productive, right? And of course, there were huge uprisings uh, and dissatisfaction with all of this new technology, uh, similar to what there is today. Um, but in the 19th century, workers started to organize. They started to say, all right, children maybe shouldn't be working so much. And eventually they said, okay, maybe children shouldn't be working at all. Um, maybe we shouldn't work more than 10 hours a day. Um, maybe we should organize into unions, right? And so that allowed workers to finally start capturing some of the additional benefit uh, of the production, right? You can see wages here are flat from 1750 to 1850, and then they start finally to go up, right? Slowly at first, and then finally in the 20th century, they really start to take off. And part of that uh, has to do with universal voting for males in 1918, and then finally for everybody in 1928. Remember, this is the UK that we're talking about, not the US. Um, and you can see that wages in the 20th century really exploded. And that's what we see in Western Europe, in the United States. Um, and it's what we're seeing right now in places like India and China, right? They're starting on that explosive path, that hockey stick path. And so the escape part of the Malthusian trap, right, which he, of course, didn't foresee and couldn't know, um, was that that technological revolution allows, first of all, people to be able to produce more, right? The spinning jenny makes it able, you able to produce a lot more per hour. Um, agricultural revolution means that there's a lot of displaced workers that are looking for work. And so what we get, we get average output going up, but we don't have wages going up yet, right? But because we have these higher profits, we get the expansion of factory production. Britain is making textiles that they are exporting all over the world. Demand for labor rises. And we grow, we're growing our production technology so fast that eventually that production rises above some critical point that allows us to escape that Malthusian trap, right? And because we're able to escape that Malthusian trap, now all of a sudden we're able to get more political rights. We're able to limit the amount of work we have to do. We're able to put safety standards in. We're able to get the vote for everybody. We're able to make sure that our bargaining power increases. And finally, we get these higher wages. So if we want to think about Malthus's law, right, because he wasn't wrong. He was one of the, I think, smartest economists of his day. Um, he just didn't anticipate this huge leap in production technology, right? And so that, that third bullet says you're going to be caught in that Malthusian trap without that improvement to technology to offset the diminishing average product of labor. You can think of our production technology as just rising so fast that the average product of labor is actually increasing despite the extra population. And so it's an important lesson that, you know, the Malthusian model is great in explaining sort of what was going on before the Industrial Revolution, but doesn't do a good job of explaining what's going on after the Industrial Revolution. So keep that in mind with all of our models, that none of them are perfect, that they're often designed to answer a specific question, and they may fail when asked to answer another question.